Okay, so I've introduced you to two of the three domains of life. We've talked about the prokaryotes and how they've been separated into the eubacteria and archaea domains, but we're going to shift our focus now and talk a little bit more about that third domain of life. And that's the one that we most associate with, not only because we're part of the domain, but because a lot of the organisms within it are not microscopic, so we can see them and interact with them. And the one binding characteristic of all of these organisms in this domain is the presence of a true nucleus, or a membrane-enclosed piece of genetic information. And we refer to organisms that exist within this domain as eukaryotes. That is, their cells have membrane-bound organelles. So within this eukarya domain, there are four kingdoms that we're going to take a more closer look at. One of them being the animal kingdom that we're a part of, the other one being a plant kingdom, and the last two being the focus of this video, those are the protists and the fungi. Now, everybody has one of these in their house. That's right, it's a junk drawer, and everybody's got one of these in their house. It's got loose change and thumbtacks and stamps and receipts and used batteries. It's things that we are going to keep, but we just don't know where to put them. And when we talk about the protists, they're kind of like the junk drawer of living things. The characteristics of a protist are kind of like this. It has to be eukaryotic, which makes sense because it's in the eukary domain, and it just can't be a plant, an animal, or a fungus and basically everything else just gets crammed into there. But imagine a junk drawer now over 200,000 organisms. That's, that's a pretty big junk drawer. But just because they are found in our junk drawer, don't get the sense that these organisms are not important. They are found in massive quantities in the bodies of water of the world, including the oceans. And much like bacteria, they are responsible for a lot of the photosynthetic processes that go on on this planet. They are responsible for a large amount of the oxygen in the atmosphere and removing a large amount of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And as such, they are producers in a majority of aquatic food webs. And they are a source of economic importance as well. They are used potentially as a biofuel, sometimes fertilizers, in the production of nutrient agar, which is a growth medium used in laboratories. And also, these organisms can be used as a food source. Sushi, anyone? And just because we can eat some of these things, it doesn't mean that all of them are safe. Like many other microscopic organisms, some of them are parasitic and can be harmful. Giardia is a genus of protist that is found in some water supplies that can cause severe intestinal distress. And because it can be found in water supplies surrounding or near beaver dams, it's been affectionately called beaver fever. And some of the side effects would include, oh, nausea, diarrhea, vomiting, all of the good stuff. And sometimes, at the same time, I'm not going to show a picture of that. Uh, I'll let you picture that yourself. But the one that we associate most with protists would probably be malaria. And the cause is not mosquitoes. Mosquitoes are the vector, the means by which this particular protozoan or protist gets into the bloodstream. These little protists, or these little protozoa found in the bloodstream can cause severe effects on the individual, seizures, uh, organ failure, even death. So just like the other microorganisms we've looked at, there are both positive and negative impacts and effects that these organisms have on living things, and humans are, of course, no exception. Now, just because I have referred to the protists as the junk drawer of living things, it doesn't mean that we haven't tried to classify them. In very broad strokes, we have grouped them into categories based on some of the characteristics that they share with other kingdoms. So we have plant-like protists, and we have animal-like protists, and we have fungi-like protists. And we've also officially sort of classified some of these protists based on the way that they move. Ciliates move through a fluid medium based on the action or motion of cilia. And the flagellates move through a fluid medium through the action or motion of one or more flagella. Now I want to talk about this group of organisms for just a second because they fit into this category of being, for the most part, plant-like protists. Now there are some that are actually what we refer to as mixotrophic. They are both autotrophic, meaning they can use photosynthesis, but they also acquire nutrients by ingesting other organisms. At any rate, one of the interesting things that these organisms can cause is a red tide. Now this red tide, the reason that it's interesting is not necessarily that it forms, but because of the action of these organisms when they're disturbed, especially noticeable at night. Now if you've ever seen images like this, 
This is what these tiny organisms do when they're disturbed, and it's kind of like a defense mechanism that is producing light to distract the predator, and in doing so, they produce this awesome display of bioluminescence. Now, bioluminescence, if we think about that word, just refers to bio, a living thing, luminescence producing light. Now, you're probably familiar with this type of phenomenon if you've ever seen or caught a firefly. Now, the animal-like protists are heterotrophic. They rely on acquiring nutrients from other organisms, and two of the most well-known protists are found in this particular grouping, the amoeba and paramecium species. And these species of organisms have means by which they acquire nutrients by consuming other organisms, and some of them even have primitive eye spots that respond to light. The third grouping of these protists is what we refer to as the fungi-like protists, and really the only thing that they share with fungi is that they produce through spores. Now, a lot of these are single-celled, but sometimes they can amalgamate into a group of cells that we refer to as a plasmodium or slime mold, and these slime molds actually move and creep over dead and decaying matter until such time that this thing has to reproduce. It produces little stalks or fruiting bodies and releases the spores into the surrounding environment. Now, speaking of spores and fungi-like, we're gonna remove the like and talk about the kingdom fungi. Oh, stop. It's true, though. Now, when we think about these fungi, there are over 100,000 different species that have been classified or categorized as fungi so far. And if you think about fungi, you probably associate it most with this, and you've probably eaten mushrooms before. If you're fancy, maybe you've eaten truffles or had truffle oil. You've probably tasted something that utilizes yeast, like bread. Now, maybe you've had penicillin to fight an infection, or maybe you've had an infection yourself, known as athlete's foot. But, regardless of this, all of these fungi have the same or similar characteristics. They are obviously eukaryotic, being in the domain eukarya. They are multicellular. They are composed of cell walls that contain chitin, which is a structural carbohydrate, which we will actually talk about a little bit later on when we get to animals and the exoskeletons of insects. Most of these organisms are saprophytic as well, meaning they break down dead or decaying animal or plant waste. And so they're extremely important as decomposers in their food webs because they allow for the cycling of nutrients from that dead animal and plant matter to get back in and incorporated and taken up by the organisms of the food web. They have some very interesting close relationships with other organisms. We refer to these relationships as symbiotic. And specifically, those relationships in which both organisms benefit, we refer to as mutualism. And one such mutualistic relationship exists in a class of organisms that we refer to as lichen. So the lichen is a mutualistic symbiotic relationship between the fungus, which serves as the structural component of this organism, and a photosynthetic component, which could be a protist or it could be a bacterium. Now, another mutualistic relationship that goes on between fungi and plants exists in the soil. There is a close relationship between the root system of plants and surrounding soil fungi, in which one acquires minerals and nutrients and passes it on to the plant, and the plant, in turn, gives some of the nutrients that it makes through the process of photosynthesis to the surrounding soil fungi. Now, just because there are some mutually beneficial relationships between fungi and plants, it doesn't mean that they are all that way. There are some parasitic relationships that exist as well. Certainly, if you've ever seen fungus growing on a fruit, you will understand what this is. In fact, depending on the year and the conditions, it's estimated that up to 50% of the world's fruit can be ruined by the fungus that grows on fruit. Now, if I asked you to draw or describe a fungus, you would probably give me something like this. And yes, the mushroom is an important component of the fungus. It is the fruiting body. It is the reproductive structure. But it is only the tip of the fungal iceberg. You see, most of the fungus exists underground. Now, underground, the fungus is made of tiny little filaments that we refer to as hyphae. And these hyphae aggregate into something referred to as a mycelium. And this mycelium is the structural component of it. It's what binds or attaches to the substrate. Now, fungi go through extracellular digestion, meaning the digestion is actually done outside of the organism. And then those minerals and nutrients are absorbed into the organism. So, 
all of the hyphae that are underground, they're what are actually not only binding the organism to its particular substrate, but they're also going through the process of digestion and nutrient acquisition and water acquisition. So the vast majority of the processes of the fungus actually occur underground as a part of and through this mycelium. Now some fungi can reproduce through fragmentation or budding, but in terms of classifying and categorizing these organisms, the vast majority of them reproduce through spores. Now these spores can be produced through either meiotic or mitotic cell divisions, that is they can reproduce sexually or asexually, and as a result of both of these processes can produce these spores. Now these spores are kind of like little seeds that plants would have, but they're much, much smaller. Some fungi can produce millions or even billions or trillions of these spores, therefore increasing the likelihood that they're going to find some favorable conditions. And they have some really interesting ways of dispersing these spores as well. A lot of them are being dispersed through the air, but some of them disperse them through water or even transported on and in animals. Now these spores, once they find a favorable environment, can potentially grow up and create mature fungi. So hopefully after watching this video, you have a better understanding of the characteristics that allow us to place organisms into the junk drawer kingdom, the protists, or into the spore-producing, sometimes tasty kingdom fungi. Thanks for watching.